might want to start over. That was a, you're killing it right yeah, now. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to think what I'm actually going to say. <laughs> Welcome to the after hours. Oh yeah. Okay, so oh yeah. <laughs> now. Welcome to the After Hours Podcast. I'm Tobias Carlisle. I'm joined by Bill Brewster and Jake Taylor. Jake, what's your topic this week? Hey, Value Nerds. This week, we're going to be talking about Paul Graham's essay about uh, genius that recently was making the rounds on Twitter. And Bill, what's your topic? We're going to focus on uh, the absurdity of the debt that Curate Retail got to issue this week. That's Liberty and John Malone. And I'll be talking about the Tesla truck launch coming up right after this. Tobias Carlisle is the founder and principal of Acquire's Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquire's Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquire's Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. So I've got um, Paul Graham's essay about genius that was making the rounds on Twitter that was pretty popular. So we can talk about that. Let's do that. Okay. <clears throat> so this uh, this essay that Paul Graham posted was talking about how you know everyone kind of understands that like it's natural ability plus determination or grit, but he also added this other component to to success or genius, which was being obsessed about some topic, having some interest that you're just obsessed about. And he he reckon he made it like these uh, the bus ticket collectors, like people who collect bus tickets. Like it does no, you know, there's no real economic value to any of these things, but they're just obsessed with with collecting bus tickets. And this recipe that he kind of lays out, um, I found it very interesting. Uh, the idea that maybe you you actually have to waste a lot of time looking around at different things that you're interested in and not so much worried about how is this going to to lead to me being successful necessarily. So I'm thinking about like Steve Jobs and you know he took calligraphy classes in college. I mean, what is what was the point of that? Well, it turns out later you know all these dots connecting that that having beautiful fonts in an Apple was a differentiator for their product. So we really can't know what is the, where does this go necessarily, but we just kind of have to pick things that we're interested in and be willing to deep dive on them. So Bill, what do you think about that? No, I think that makes, that's a, you know, it was an interesting essay to read and, and the, uh, the idea of being interested in the process, right. And not looking to do something for the purpose of finding something tangible today. I think, uh, you know, is pretty interesting. And, and, and the notion of if you're obsessed with something, you're willing to stick with it, even if there's, um, you know, not, as I said, like a, an immediate tangible benefit. Um, you know, you think about digging through some of these stocks. I mean, a lot of them are no's, right? And, and the, um, the knowledge builds and you hope eventually you can use it. Uh, and I think that it's at least a healthy way to think about uh, getting through some of the nose at a minimum, right? Like I'm getting closer. And I, I think that that was a useful, useful framework. I think it's, it's a good model for finding folks who are going to be successful investors. It might be a good VC model for finding good CEOs, but I think about it also in terms of, so, you know, Joe Rogan has this podcast, right? We're on a podcast. Everybody's got a podcast these days, but you know, there's no reason why that podcast isn't as, you know, as, as successful as like a CB radio show, right? So the, Joe Rogan could easily be, hey, you remember that dude who was on this TV show in the 90s news radio? He's now, he commentates on the, on the uh, you know, UFC, which is now that's very successful, but it's possible that, that wouldn't be successful too. And guess what? He's got a CB radio show that services, you know, some tiny little area somewhere. You just feel like that's an interesting kind of tidbit to know about that guy. But... It turns out his CB radio show is podcasting. And so now, you know, there's some study out there that says that, or Andrew Wilkinson did this analysis of it. He says he's probably a billionaire from this podcast platform. Like he could probably, he's making like $100 million a year. He could probably sell a portion of it for a billion dollars. He'd get a billion dollar valuation if he wanted it. So wow. I think what I think that speaks to is that you can get very lucky. Like you can be a 
You can be a train spotter. You can be collecting bus tickets. Uh, you can be Joe Rogan. And that's basically what we're trying to do. Like We're trying to not be collecting bus tickets. We're trying to collect things that ultimately have some great value. Because I have seen, you know, I know, I've known deep value guys years and years ago. They were all very odd, gnome-like dudes in their little <laughs> offices that would look terrible. You know, threadbare carpet, old filing cabinet. You know, they, they were just guys who just loved the chase. They loved just finding these little nuggets. And you, they'd explain to you why they're buying something. And you'd be, that's a terrible business. That's an, you know, it makes... It makes, uh, you know, it makes fabric or something like that. You know, why would you invest in that? And then if you find out five years later, they've gone 10x or something on that position. So I, I think it's a good model. I think the part for me that was the, the biggest takeaway was when he was talking about the kids um, and what he does for his kids, which was really encourages them to dive deep on anything that they're interested in and just kind of get work the muscle out of, of really getting deep into something. You just you don't have time to do that at school. Uh, and it's probably discouraged as well. Like you're always moved on to the next period for, you know, you yeah. know close your math books. It's time for English. Um, so for me, I, I've been trying to think about different ways that I can encourage my my kids to whatever it is that they're interested in to really push them to dive deep on it. And so what do you do? Uh, well, just feed it's, the it's, feed the curiosity. Yeah, exactly. Just like keep asking them questions. Um do, it's really more like don't discourage them when they want to right. dive deep on something probably. Just while, while we were telling that story, it just reminded me of uh, the investor Ron Briley who I, I wrote about in Deep Value and uh, he's a Kiwi. He spent some time in Australia and then he ended up in the UK and he's he's got that very Deep Value style where he likes balance sheet value. and He also does uh, he was a raider back in the 80s and he's still an activist he still tries to get control of boards and do things like that uh, his uh, his UK company was GPG and GPG had a big holding in this company called Coates now, I don't know if you guys know what Coates is but basically what Coates is that at the at the time I they, they made like thread they make wool and so now they, I looked them up online. They, they say we're the world's leading industrial thread business, harnessing talent and technology and textiles to enhance people's lives. So I just think that that's a, that's a pretty good demonstration of, they used to call him the bag lady of, uh, of business because he just liked to call, you know, just he'd go around with this little plastic bag and fill it up with all of these random businesses like that. So that's, and he's, you know, one of the, the world's great investors. So. That's my aspiration to be the bag lay, the bag man of uh, maybe not bag man. That's not a good term, but You're the, the ho uh, hobo of value. The hobo of value, just collecting all of these garbage old businesses, and hopefully they turn out to be really good ones. Well, that's why I say you're the modern day Walter Schloss. <laughs> that's kind. It's not true, but it's kind. Well, the aspirational one. Well, that, that that actually we got to, we've got to come back to this in a moment. But you you go on with your tangent. No, I was just going to say you know it's it's interesting because I've been going through your other podcasts, right? And um, you know to have this conversation on the back of listening to Marcelo P Lima and then the guys at Ensemble, you know where where it seems like the modern day value investing has just deviated so much, right? I mean, I'm listening to Sean and Todd talk about. Um, you know, the persistence of Roik and how at the firm level it, it's persistent, right? Even though in a market level, it's mean reverting. And there's, uh, you know, where are the bus ticket collectors and the bag holders? They're, you know, they're sort of uh, shutting up shop, right? Well, it's been very tough. It's one of those markets that has, you know, if you're, what, what, what historically happens when you divide the world and divide the investment universe into deciles based on some value metric, the cheaper ones tend to outperform the next cheap and so on and so on until the most expensive ones don't work or they generate a return that's lower than the market. That's not been true for the last five or 10 years that more expensive ones have worked. So I can understand why a lot of investors, particularly value investors, have evolved because that's you find that the things that work are the more expensive things that compound and the things that don't work are the cheap things that you know that, that, that don't go up. So there was a... There was a Chris Meredith, who's one of the quants at uh, O'Shaughnessy, had this little metric 
or this little ch- uh, table yesterday that he shared that he was just looking at the late 1990s versus today and he said um, basically just looking at the, di- the the movement in the multiple of the value portfolio versus the multiple of the growth portfolio and so in the in the in the late 1990s the the portfolio the multiple for value contracted multiple for glamour expanded that's atypical and so it led to this like outperformance for glamour over value of like 15% or 19% something like that what on was a, the multiple on was it was it book or earnings earnings, or? earnings. Okay. yeah sorry so that and and they've that that built on some previous work that they had put together where they they said that the way that um, you know growth companies do their earnings do go up but the multiple compresses where for value the earnings go down but the multiple expands and so when that reverses that's when you get something like this in the market where growth outperforms so materially so I think it's a totally rational evolution for guys to evolve away from this style of deep value investment but I do think it's cyclical well, and I guess what what they would probably say, like, is especially the ensemble guys, because you guys got talking to, I, I think Sean had mentioned, you know, over a five year period, earnings growth is what actually drives returns. As you expand your horizon, you know, the persistence in the actual underlying business, uh, you know, drives most of your return, which I think, um, you know, I, I don't know, a lot of us uh, value people are are really focused on the entry multiple. And it's, you know, got me thinking whether or not I worry too much about that. But then I, you know, talk to myself and I say, well, how good are you at really predicting a business 20 years away? And uh, that's where my hang up then comes, right? So it's funny, you know, 10 years ago, I did not hear a lot of people saying, gee, I wish I'd paid up for that business. Yeah. I, I missed it. And I should have just pulled the trigger. It was at 30 times earnings. Now it's at 60 times earnings. I should have pulled it when I was at 30. You know, it was the other way around. Everybody was like, damn, I wish I hadn't been so impatient. I should have just waited until I got my price. It's just the turn of the market. I think it's cyclical. I, I'm probably one of the very small handful of people who actually think that. And I probably look like an idiot until it gets proven otherwise, but I'm prepared to do that. I think I my, my big concern is that you know, technological change is happening faster than probably any time in history. And the, the risk <clears throat> of obsolescence of many of these businesses, the returns on capital can disappear overnight even for some of these potentially. I don't know which ones, and I don't think anyone does. That's kind of the point. Like there's, you're making this bet implicitly that that, that returns are going to stay high for some of these companies and and frankly, some of them, you know, if you kind of use like a Lindy uh, effect view where like some of them have only been around a little while to assume that they're going to be around for another 50 years when they've only been around 10 to start out with, I think is a little bit dangerous. Uh, and I don't I don't really hear anyone talking about about that very much, except maybe the three of us. <laughs> I, I, I kind of like that. I, was, I actually thought you were going to be talking about value stocks then. I thought you were going to say those are the ones at risk of obsolescence. That was a that was an unexpected twist there. Well, you know, like a firm like Ferrari, I think that that you can bet on the persistence of that brand. Um, you know, like LVMH is one that I, I pay some attention to. I mean, it's incredible what they've done with those brands. But here they are buying Tiffany. And, you know, Tiffany might be cheap here, but it's definitely not a distressed asset. So are they sort of getting into uh, one of these issues where now now to get your next growth you're paying up for a business that maybe is not what you think it is and how much can they uh get the synergies out of pushing it into their their method and distribution system i don't know what i'm not smart enough to know what can go on at tiffany but i just sort of wonder if you're backward looking and now they're doing a big acquisition for growth what does the forward return of that business look like stuff like that gets hard you know but i guess they've done it for a while, so it's Bernard Arnault. Arnault, how do you say how do you say his name? I think you're right. There was a, he had a great quote. I think possibly you shared it on Twitter yesterday. The one about he thinks that he can grow the prestige of the brand over the next. Oh, decade. that wasn't me. I think that his his focus of it was something like he thought not so much the financial performance, but if he could make the brand um, 
more attractive, for, for want of a better word, over the next decade, then he would regard that as success. That's what he's aiming to do. Okay, well, I mean, how do you do that? You spend money on advertising and lower your returns on capital, right? I kind of think that he, like I've read a little bit about him. He's one of those guys, a little bit like John Malone, who, who we should come back to in a moment. But there are these, uh, I think there are some brilliant guys out there. And one of the things that he does is he says, um, he, he early on in his career, he was buying these companies that had the low returns on invested capital or, or low sort of margins. And he said, you know, you, you, you struggle along with the low margins or you get these things that have got very fat margins. And that's why he's attracted to luxury because you can always charge gigantic you know, prices that aren't supported by what you're actually selling there. You have to have some of that brand magic in there. And the Tiffany's a great example, right? They sell the same jewelry as anybody else. It's just that it comes in that little uh, aqua box or whatever color that box is. And that's the entire, that's it. That's what you get for the, for the premium. Well, and you get a smile on your, on your uh, significant other's face, right? But, but that I guess that that is where my question on that acquisition comes from. And it's, you know, I'm not informed on it, but I do wonder, like, I mean, that brand has value today. That's why they can charge what they can charge. So how much can you really improve it? And the answer may be what a lot. What are the metrics? How expensive is it? Oh, I, I mean, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't want to start talking numbers because I'll look like a moron. But I just think, you know, like from a story perspective, right, where – where do you take Tiffany? I don't know. It, it to well, me, well, name, it feels... name another. What's another? What name another jewelry brand? Yeah, I really can't. I mean, that's every, every kiss begins with a K. Yeah, well, and then you have the higher end. You got Cartier and stuff like that, right? But I don't know. Tiffany's is like the Starbucks of jewelry to me. It's the I'm Starbucks sure it's of luxury make... jewelry, right? It's not... that's right. Yeah. So they're mastige. They've got that nice point between. They're like a BMW, maybe. It's like yeah. you see BMWs are everywhere all over the road, but it's an expensive car. So it's like it's not like it's not like a Rolls Royce where you see a Rolls Royce like once a quarter or something like that. You see a B, you see like ten BMWs every time you go out on the road. So Beam is probably making more money out of that kind of brand. Maybe Tiffany's the same thing. It is aspirational, but they're also selling a lot of it. I just yeah. want to point out it's funny that you say that you would see it once a quarter. Like most people would say like once every three or four months. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's how I think. I know. I, I live my life a quarter mile at a time, or whatever that, a quarter at a time. I, I thought you were going to say, I thought you were having, because I'm in Los Angeles, like it probably are a larger number of them around than, I don't know, other places. With IPO cycles? Yeah, well, maybe, that's maybe how San you Francisco. Can judge it. The problem with San Francisco is you'd never be able to park it. Like you, you, you pay, whatever you pay for the car, you've got to pay just as much again for the, for the parking. That's the prestige item in San Francisco. That makes sense. That's why people Uber, right? So let's. Uh, my, I, I have a couple of topics. I, I've got a throwaway one because I, I want to talk about the Cybertruck a little bit. Oh yes, let's do this. So uh, I think that Musk is an incredible genius because he's had the most profitable Kickstarter ever, <laughs> where basically he's come out and he's shown a prototype of a car that like it could it could have just gone down to a sound stage in los angeles and said give me your like space age looking thing give me some truck that's come off the next episode of mad max and he's driven that on stage and he said here's the website where you go to you give me a hundred bucks refundable and he's taken two hundred thousand he's got 20 million bucks that that doesn't make much difference to to musk one way or the other but that's a pretty impressive kickstarter wouldn't you say well, here's the here's the question: is was is he such a genius that he knew that the glass was going to break, and then that was all a publicity stunt to 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 have everyone talking about it? I mean, it's kind of that forty eight laws of power of you know the publicity you don't think the at all. The design of the truck, the kind of the weird design of the truck, was the thing that was supposed to get attention because he knows that that's not street legal, right? You can't have sharp corners and no uh, no 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 mirrors, uh, no mirrors yet. <laughs> He should have just had big spikes on it, like that last Mad Max fire, fire coming out of the. Yeah, that's just a street legal, you know. It, it is. It is a truly atrocious looking truck, which I'm sure people are going to get mad at me saying. But it's it's like a bad DeLorean. Um, yeah. Which is so weird because the the Model S I think is a pretty car. 
uh, and it's got styling. And then here you roll out like a metal box, like a like a Terminator box. <laughs> but then he said you can't because it it looks plainer uh, because the cold rolled steel you can't punch it into a shape because it breaks the stamping machinery. That's why it has to look like that. So basically, if you get in an accident with this thing, it's just going to plow through your car and destroy everything. It's going to vaporize any yeah. pedestrian. It's, it's basically a snow plow if you like crashed into somebody. And just okay. Like... So I good. I'll know to avoid them. I did enjoy the all the stuff on Twitter about it, like the different jokes and memes that came out, and I I often think about that like. Gosh, if only we could harness all this creativity in the world for good, you know, it, it ends up manifesting in, in making fun of things because the, <laughs> the creativity is off the charts to me. Like it's 10 out of 10, but there's some really good ones on that one. What, what, like, what, have you got any examples? Am I going to put you on the spot? Oh yeah. I mean, I really like the, um, they showed that, I don't know if you remember the Tomb Raider, like Laura Croft had these very angular, uh, right. you know, and endowment and, uh, it did look like the front of the truck. Like it was like the, <laughs> this triangular, you know, scalar looking. Yeah, I saw, uh, I saw, geometry. I saw another one with uh, the, and it was the guy who, the guy who programmed uh, the computer game where you're, you, I can't think what the name of it is now, but it's, uh, it's the one that they make the red versus blue uh, comic out of, or the red versus blue cartoon. No. I don't know. I don't know. I should, Sorry, man. Yeah, we're, none of us are computer game players, but they had the guy who designed the original truck it was called a warthog in this in this in this uh, computer game. He said it basically looked the low polygon version of it looked exactly like the truck, and then they put in the characters from it in the back with a big gun and one of the characters <laughs> driving it. So it was very funny. It's one of those that I just assume that the Longs have done a lot better research on than I have because, I mean, I'm not short it either because I'm just terrified of getting my face ripped off on it. But, well, like, I don't understand. I, I think, I, to me, Musk and Trump are the same. Like, like the people that like them see one thing, the people that hate them see another, and there's crazy polarization around them. And he rolls out this crazy cyber truck, and we're talking about whether or not he plays 4D chess. Like, if it's anybody else, that's just a crazy idea, right? But here he's got the posits and, you know, people love it. So it, It's and so other funny. It. When I saw Cybertruck written, because it was written in that funky lettering, I read it as clusterfuck and it had like the, <laughs> the blown in windows. I was like, that's, I can't believe that nobody did, nobody changed the wording at the back. I did so like I, the, I liked how like t the, the Tesla Q community like jumped on the video because he had another one that came out later where they showed yeah. like it not breaking and like that turned into the Z Zapruder film yeah. you know where like they're just like tearing it apart frame by frame looking for clues like who you know who was on the grassy knoll like it was because <laughs> they said I, that it, the, the window had been impacted in that first test where the where the, uh, the dude threw the ball and it bounced off the window right it looked like it had been collapsed a little bit or it fell after they threw that ball at it well, and I think they had like the door was open already and they mm -hmm. had some blanket over it to like mm -hmm. hide that the, the door was open. Like, I don't know. I mean, it's it's so funny the level that that people will want to see what they want to see. And then, well, the, of course, the test where he had the two trucks, right? The truck, I said the truck was only two wheel drive and there was no weight in the back, whereas the Tesla truck is four wheel drive and it's heavy because it's got the battery in the back. And then they had Neil deGrasse Tyson leans in. And he says, give some explanation about torque and, and then some, that's T-O-R-Q-U-E and friction. And then some Formula One driver leaned into the same conversation. Like, this is the power of Twitter, right? But basically, they're, they're all calling bullshit on, on Musk. Well, at Tesla Q, like, those guys are, you know, at, at this point, it's just wolves looking for any scrap of meat that they can get. I mean... And I, I, I don't say that lightly. I mean, some of the stories that I've heard out of that community, I feel really badly, right? Because some of the, some of the research is really impressive. And, I, you know, from the anecdotes that I've heard, the sizing of the bets has really taken some people well, out. That's and the I, silly I thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't wish that upon anybody. But, man, you see Tesla Q get loose on, a, on a, any scrap of fraud, and it's like, oh, let's go. 
it's hard to see. Like I and there's other there's smart guys out like Chanos, who's a legendary short seller, who's been a short seller for so long that he just knows how to survive. He is very negative on Tesla, and he he's very critical, pulls apart the accounts. Like if if he's if he's negative, if he's attract if he's attracted to it, that's pretty comprehensive that's pretty conclusive isn't it like it's not well I've einhorn einhorn calling einhorn. out accounts receivable right things like he wants to see like why are accounts receivable ballooning the way they are and right like he's like you know people are tagging kpmg you know like the accountant or who i don't i think it's, it's pwc yeah. or pwc okay yeah tagging them in it like hey you guys better be like looking a little harder or else you got lawsuits coming I, it's it's so funny to me the way the information coalesces into twitter in in the full disclosure i am short uh in some of the things that i do and i it's it's you know it's ripped my face off this quarter we only short it to a very small but we only short it to a very small percentage of the portfolio and so it's well, hurt because it's gone the wrong direction this is the stuff that like i i've I've re-listened to Buffett and Munger talk shorting and you know, Munger's whole thing is like, I know that I've seen, so let's assume that Elon is a fraud for this purpose, right? He says like, I have seen frauds and I've seen the stock double on you while you think it's a fraud. And it's just not worth the stress in my life to identify these things. Even if I know it's right, I just rather like live without that. So even if Tesla Q is right, which, you know, to some of them, I hope they are. I mean, or, or at least I hope that their returns mirror their um, Effort. dedication to the cause. Uh, but, you know, it's like, <laughs> man, that's you're really changing your life for this. I, yeah. I don't know that it's worth it. I yeah, think I Buffett's agree. been even more emphatic about it, saying, like, I've never been wrong on a short yeah. that I've that. But I've just never been the timing. It's just never been worth it. Yep. But you don't necessarily have to short like that, right? You don't have to short. It's shorting is. I think shorting is different to owning long. Like you, you can be short across a portfolio. And do I think that that portfolio is going to do worse than the inverse of the index? You know, so is it going to go down more than the index goes down when the market goes down? Absolutely. I mean that they're just you. You're buying like you're buying vapor. You're buying just like hot air completely, or you're shorting hot air and you're just waiting for the holes to kind of like for that to come down i i i don't but i i'm you know i'm i'm short tesla so i'm in that kind of i look at tesla q and i think they're nuts as well but i'm just you know i i'm not going to not put it on or put it on because what other people are doing i've got my own assessment of it and i think that it's a i think that it's a short even knowing all of the dangers of shorting you know well i think i think what i like about how you uh proceed in what you do is you're you're taking a basket approach to a lot of this stuff, right. right? And then when you have a momentum overlay to something that you perceive to be borderline fraudulent or super expensive, that that makes a lot of sense to me and mitigates some of the risk that I you know think. And we could quite eas- easily be out of it this quarter by yeah. virtue of the fact that it's gone up so much. That's just one of the things that is in our is in the model that if it moves that much against you, then you shouldn't be you, you, you're missing something. Or you need to show it more. I don't know. What's the? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, rebalance at least. And rebalancing typically means taking a short that's not worked down, reducing the size. Because that, that is the big problem with shorting. Like if you're wrong on a long and you just stay in bed and you can't get out because you're just so sick with what you've done, that problem eventually solves itself because it goes to zero. <laughs> Whereas with a short, at some stage, you have to grasp the nettle and take the loss. And so you have to have some process for dealing with that. So I'm pretty comfortable with the process that that we have. I had yeah, a pretty I mean, that's, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say I heard a pretty interesting idea. Like everyone's, everyone thinks about position sizing. Like you don't want it to get too big because you're trying to mitigate risk. Uh, I, I've heard someone advocate actually for minimum position sizing. So if you get down, like if a, if something shrinks enough to where it's you know let's say it gets down to one percent for either the rest of your portfolio grew or it shrunk. There, you could make the argument that either you need to just sell and punch out or re-up to get back up to a, a more normal position mm. size. Um, so using that as kind of a forcing function to to reassess some of your positions, I think, is an interesting idea. That's interesting. I, I don't yeah, know it can I... cause you to dollar cost average at the right time. If you're not, you know, if you think you're still right, then, you know, my rule says I have to buy more. 
I like because right, jo- it's real easy to just sit there and twiddle your thumbs and kind of hope that something fixes itself. You know. Yep. I like John Hampton's approach to dollar cost averaging. He wrote a great he he wrote a great post on it where you know there's there's two schools of thought right. There's that losers average losers, which is the um, Paul Tudor Jones famously has that chart above his above his desk when he was younger. So that means don't if you make a mistake and it goes down, then you you don't 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 double up on your mistake, don't compound your mistake by buying more. Then you've got the value guys like Buffett, like where and if you ask most value guys who've been around for a long time, they will say that a great deal of their return has come from doubling down onto those positions that went against them. And I think Hampton Hampton said, you know, do it but do it with some some care. I think I think you can be a little bit more precise. Like you just have to be careful what kind of business you're doubling down on. If it's a cyclical you shouldn't be doubling down on cyclicals. Cyclicals can go against you and vaporize what you hold. If it's a business that's a little bit better quality business, and I know I talk a lot about it's hard to tell the difference, but there, is, there are better quality businesses than others. If a better quality business is going against you price-wise, but the underlying business is performing okay, there's no problem with buying a little bit more of it. If it's That's where you're going to get a lot of return, right? Ideally, I mean, that's... Isn't that the, one of the difficult things to untangle, though, is kind of what's cyc- cyclical and what's secular? Uh, you know, it goes down typically for a reason, you yeah. know, and it's it's something that everyone's like, well, they start to question the validity of the business, right? This yeah. is a fantastic time to give listeners a reminder to do their own research. <laughs> uh, and the reason, and this is real, right? You don't know when somebody's thesis changes, Right. And if you don't know when their thesis is right or wrong, you don't know whether or not you should be buying more or selling. And, uh, you know, like it, like I had circulated the Blue Links thesis to you guys a year ago. Right. And I, I thought it was a pretty decent thesis. And ultimately I passed. I mean, if I had gotten in that and didn't know why, I mean, the, the last couple of days have just been brutal in that thing. And this is the. You got to figure out if you're right or wrong if you're long that thing, and if you are, buy hand over fist. And if you're not, uh, you know. So, I don't know. It, it is. It's an interesting. Um, it's an interesting question, and it's hard to know if you're right. You probably don't find out the answer for a couple of years, which is not exactly the most fun thing in the world. It's the tough thing about this business that there's no immediate. Resp- you know, you don't know whether you're doing the right thing for like you've been doing it for five years, and you doing the right thing you could still be underperforming yeah the and the conviction required to see it through to see if you're right or wrong can really take a lot out of you psychologically <laughs> that's that's why you need to be that bus ticket collector guy who just you just like the you like the color of the tickets you just like collecting them you're not doing it for any other reason what's what's your topic bill um, well, I had gotten on the uh, the persistence of Roik a little bit, um, but I'm going to pivot since we talked about that and talk a little bit about Liberty Day and oh, yeah. uh, one of my men crushes, uh, John Malone. And, uh, you know, they were up there. So they, they have a entity called uh, Curate Retail. It's QVC, HSN and Zulily. And then I think there's a couple other little assets in there. Um you know, they, they were talking, they had just issued debt. I might get the year wrong. It really doesn't matter because once I tell you the decade, the actual year doesn't matter. They issued notes in QVC and HSN. Somebody bought these. They expire in 2068. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, and, what, like and they're, a and they're 2% paying. rate? No, no, six and a half. Okay, so at least you get a little bit of money. But, like, I mean – that's equity risk. Who who owns that? I, I don't under. I mean, the the equity is yielding almost sixteen percent free cash flow yield. You know that how these guys work. They're going to continue to issue debt and buy in the shares if they think the entity has any viability. So you're basically just letting them arbitrage their free cash flow yield and taking equity risk. It's insane to me what's going on in the debt markets. You, I mean, you're the levered finance guy. So how, how do you how do you assess that? What's the you, give us your expertise? I, man, I don't know. I think there's a lot of dumb buyers out there, and I, I I have to think that maybe it's 
asset liability matching where they're forced to do it, or maybe it's some ETF, or, you know, it boggles my mind how any rational human would say, yeah, that's the paper I want to accept. I, I just really don't understand it. And, maybe it's and, just in your mandate. Yeah, well, that's right. It's, it's like, liberty. It's probably like they're good managers. It's got lots of free cash flow. They're probably going to be able to pay it. We need uh, that yield, son. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I think it is, right? Like, oh, how are we going to hit this hurdle rate we need to? Oh, we'll just take this, you know, piece of crap and throw it in the portfolio. But the rumor that I heard is that retail took down a lot of that um, offering and that the professionals stayed away. But I, that was anecdotes. I, I'm not able to uh, yeah. confirm or deny that, that rumor. I know I didn't take any of it down. That I know. You will not be finding that in the Brewster household portfolio anytime soon. Well, what's what's a good well, like? I, I this is not this is way outside my area of expertise. What's a good yield? Like, what yield are you going to buy that stuff at? Nothing. You can't pay me <laughs> enough to own that piece of paper. I mean, I guess you know, twenty five percent, but they're not going to issue it at that. There, there's no deal that I would be on that side of that. That's actually rational, right? Like. They would they would say no. I'm just not going to do it. So it's a it's a forty year note, is it? Is that the is or 50, 40, 50, fifty year note? A fifty year note. Ugh. It's equity risk. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to. And it's... like, if that defaults, equity might not even be that long a duration. <clears throat> For the average yeah. company's life is what you know. 25 years or something yeah. they were laughing when they were talking about issuing the paper oh, and God. even greg maffey was saying he was like we're not going to be around when this thing expires and and they you know it's not nefarious what they're doing right i mean I, if somebody will buy it i almost you know don't see the reason not to do it it just like I mean, you always was... have a fiduciary obligation to issue it don't you your That's obligations right. to your to the company and to the shareholders yeah, I, I I can't comment on that directly, but I did watch Malone's interview uh, on CNBC on Friday afternoon. Have you have you guys seen that? Yeah, it's in my queue to watch. I haven't watched it yet. I got to say, I I love Malone. He's one of my favorite kind of investor operator guys out there. You know, along with Bernard, along with Warren, they're just he they he's such a great investor. Um, and one of the my, one of my favorite parts as I was watching this thing, and I watch it. He does these annually now, uh, and it's a really pleasant way to spend an hour if you like investing and you like this stuff. He talks about how he bought. So he bought seventy five million dollars worth of Discovery A D I S C A is the ticker, and he said I ran. My favorite screen is levered free cash flow to market cap. Yep. I ran the screen. The top name was. I was like, oh, surprise! The top name's Discovery. It did D- Disc A. And so I bought $75 million worth. And that was like, that was the full extent of his analysis. Clearly he knows the business really well. I'm not, I'm not arguing the toss there, but I kind of like that. Like he's, that's a very simple approach to investing. I kind of like it. Would you say though, that there's some, there's a little bit of survivorship bias with him where like he, he has levered up his entire career and, and benefited from increasingly cheap debt over and over and over again. Like there is some tailwind there that he captured. Now, whether he was just a genius and saw it and, you know, bought pretty pretty reasonably cash flowing assets and, and levered them up. But there is some like alternate universe where things got really sideways and he defaulted and, and like exploded and then he's a cautionary tale, right? Am I the only one who thinks that way? No, Does now, he ever is get... the time, now is the time that you can apologize to John Malone. Thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's, I, I, that's a fact. Look, I, I don't know the story well enough. I've read, I read uh, Cable, Cable Cowboy. Cowboy. Yeah. But I read it so long ago now that I can't remember if they – were there early periods where they were at struggling? Yeah, TCI wasn't the, – the original entity was not uh, all, you know, rainbows and whatnot. But I – He's abnormally smart, and I think he understands debt way better than most. I, I This is another disclosure to any listeners. You know, his discovery and his curate positions came out of when he was running TCI, and he could buy them and bundle them, and he was part of the distribution, and he knew if I put these channels on my uh, cable networks, you know, I can actually make them succeed. 
So his cost basis, I mean, yes, he's putting real money in today. But the other thing is, I don't know, 75 billion on or 75 million on a couple billion. Like that's like you and me putting, yeah, it's you know, pocket change. Yeah, that's I mean, you know, you got to think about that. What's the percentage weight in the portfolio? And it's it's crazy to think, but it's not like that huge for him. So he's, but he, the the things that he has done very well. Did did he did he create TCO? Did he inherit? I know he was the he was the he was the CEO of one of these, right? He he didn't he didn't found one. He sort of came into. Yeah, he joined TCI. He didn't found it. So the debt. I thought that he had my recollection of it, which is imperfect, but I thought that he had inherited that situation and he had kind of turned it around. Yes, I think that's an accurate representation. Because I, but, I think, but then the, it was a lot of M and A after that that was mm-hmm. mostly debt fueled and didn't have to go the way that it that it went. That's so, what, but the the argument would be that he, he figured Malone. out early that you could get some sort of uh, some sort of scale and you would get some benefits to having the scale, and so he he did that. You know what the uh, in my Marcelo Lima podcast, he calls it land and expand, which is why you got to spend so much money up front. So that's why you know Netflix is spending so much money because they're landing and expanding. And he was kind of like, well, you just got to get the biggest, you got to get the biggest network that gives you all of the network effects. So we just got to build out, and we have to win this race. It's a great but, story. But you're right; that could have that that didn't necessarily have to work. Well, it kind of reminds I'm- me of the joke about you know how do you become a billionaire? You borrow a billion dollars and then pay it back. Right. <laughs> the uh, the only thing that I will say is like those guys are super focused on cash flow. So I don't I mean, Malone did try to buy Netflix, so I can't say that he he wouldn't have done it. But I don't think that Netflix would necessarily be run the same way if he had pulled that transaction off a while ago. Um, well, that's an interesting what if. Yeah, well, he thinks so too, and uh, I, don't, I guess Reed said I'm not selling to you. That was a fascinating. That was the whole. That whole thing is fascinating. He's he's an incredibly smart guy, and if you have some background to it, you know that he's he doesn't like paying taxes. So that's why nothing ever gets sold; it gets spun out. And you know that's the part of the reason for the debt too. That mm, uh, tax if you shield. If you got a little tax shield there, and it's been a benefit to have some debt in a business and it makes sense in a recurring income business to have a little bit of debt that's a great idea well that's the only business that should have the debt anyway that's right <laughs> one that can service it mm. you so, can just roll it over that's obviously you just borrow more there's no you just keep on rolling you keep on rolling it over at lower interest rates it's it's an easy game that's right like curate so let me let me just do this is the question of the week uh this is from colby Oops, I've just lost it. Hold on. Uh, that's not good. Here we go. Um, do you advocate higher weighting positions based on opportunity or would you rather equal weight uh, positions in the portfolio? So I'll throw that out to uh, Jake first. What do I personally do? Uh, what what I... do you prefer? What do you advocate? Or what do you do? Well, I think hypothetically, you know, you should be following some kind of Kelly formula. I think that that is also can be dangerous if you're not very conservative with it. Um, I would say if you're running more of a quant strategy, I would think that equal weighting is probably the smarter play. Um, There's some research behind that that shows that models that are equally weighted uh, tend to across a broad selection of different domains tend to have better results. And I think it's really a, when you don't have the equal weighting, you can, you can kind of get your own biases baked into the algorithm. Um, but I think if you're doing more concentrated individual fundamental research of a business and you have a best idea, um, you know, I think that, I think it makes some sense to, to bet more on that idea. Um, so you know, if you talk to all of our heroes, they would say, yeah, why put money, more money into your 25th best idea when you like your, your first best idea better? Uh, but it doesn't mean it's easy. And, and often it feels like your 10th best idea does better than your, your best idea. And it's very frustrating. So, so you're advocating for some good... like fractional Kelly or some uh, like Kelly like, but not necessarily doing the Kelly calculation. I think having the Kelly framework in your mind 
just as far as risk reward and probabilities is the right way to think about it. Um, well, just simplify again, to own own more of the better opportunities or own more of the cheaper opportunities. That's right. I think that's right. But it's easier said than done, and and I think should always be approached with with a fair amount of caution and backed off from any kind of any kind of like what a gambler would come up with for a Kelly bet on a very known universe of of you know on a roulette table. You know that's a very different thing than than the investment universe. What what about you, Bill? Where do you fall out on that? I mean, I have to say that if you look at what I do, I I increase my position as I like the idea. Um, you know, the hard thing about that is some of my best investments have made me physically ill to pull the trigger on. <laughs> so to be ill and to, to size it, um, you know, is difficult. So I, I, I think that honestly, with a lot of this stuff, I think you got to do what works for you. Uh, especially if you're running your own type of portfolio and, you know, I mean, I guess if I were to to go to some sort of ETF, I would probably favor an equal weight one, just because the studies do seem to show that they outperform market cap. But um, but that not, that's not necessarily so. There are studies like uh, well, not so, studies so much, but you can look at an an, inv- an individual investor with a long track record. So someone like Carl Icahn, he his portfolio outperforms an equal weight version of his portfolio, which huh. suggests that he knows which companies are going to do better. Do you think I that, that is a that yeah? <laughs> do you think that that is representative of the broad kind of fundamental investor universe? No, I think that's 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 almost as rare as like that's why you know his name and there's Warren Buffett and you know his name and maybe there's. John Malone and you know his name but I don't think that there's very many folks who can do that and in fact I shared something on Twitter last week uh, about a firm whose name just escapes me right now but the the guy did an analysis of his own returns and he said I would have done better if I had just equal weight my position so that was what he did he he now equal weights his positions and I equal weight my positions because I I think once you if your universe so my universe is 1500 I'm holding 30 long so a decile is 150, so I'm taking 30 out of 150, which is one-fifth. So I'm taking like a tiny little portion of the por- of the universe, and I just think it's too hard to work out which ones are going to outperform. Sounds rational to me. I mean, I, I uh, yeah, I don't know. P- position sizing is, is, I think, one of the harder parts of the entire practice. Of I agree. Thing. Although you could make the argument, it's kind of interesting that you're – you have all this conviction that like these are the best ones to hold in the entire all the universe of businesses that we could buy and then you completely punt on you know that these like I can't pick the winners out of this little basket right like isn't there some a little bit of irony there so you're saying for consistency's sake i have to therefore go in and 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 weight some of them more heavily I'm just saying like recognize your own hypocrisy oh yeah of- I, i'm a hypocrite i, I fully embrace that <laughs> What's that great line from Tombstone? Uh, it appears my hypocrisy only goes so far. And then he comes back later and he says, my hypocrisy knows no bounds. That's where I'm at. Hypocrisy knows no bounds. Also, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of a small mind. I think that's Jefferson. Could be wrong. It might be Franklin. I think that that was a great question from Colby. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. So uh, we'll be back next week. That was, good, good job, that was Shake it up, stop when the clock hits 13. Sing one, two, three, four. Cause, cause, cause.